This is BYU Sports Nation, brought to you by the BYU Store, simulcast on BYU-TV and BYU-Radio. Now, from Studio B, here's Spencer Linton and Jerem Jordan. BYU Sports Nation is live, your day-to-day play-by-play in Studio B, presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU bands everywhere. Tuesday, October 13th, wherever and however you're connected. Great to have you with us. I am Spencer Linton, teamed up with Shanghai Sharks elite ball boy, Jerem Jordan. I wish. That'd be kind of fun uh, to, to do that. Apparently, uh, Jim Fredette's out of quarantine. He got to China to play in the Chinese Basketball Association season. He had to stay in his house for a while, right? And now he's out, and he's, he's still got it. Of course he's still got it. He's Jimmer. So this is him getting buckets. Uh, we saw this on the Instagram. So, uh, listen, that jump shot knows no continent, right? That's just, that's just silky smooth wherever it goes. A, a powerful jumper. I do want to mention this, too. So we have all kinds of awesome students who help work on the show. Today, we have an all-female lighting and Woo! camera crew. We have five ladies. Taking care of everything yeah. in the studio today. They are awesome. We love all of our students. But five ladies today. It smells way better than normal in here. That, this is true. This is true. Awesome. We're tipped off to this when we walk in if it does smell yes. anything other than terrible. Because, oh, there must be a guy and on the crew if it smells bad. Our dudes stink. And this, <laughs> not their skill level. <gasps> not their skill level. Oh, good stuff. We love them. They're going to be like, hey, what the heck, man? It's ladies day in Absolutely. Studio B. Absolutely. Here's today's show lineup. Does the success of BYU football's 2020 season hinge on the outcome of Friday's game? We'll dive into that. Offensive lineman Brady Christensen will join the show. Pro Football Focus loves him. We love him. Why does he love that James Empey will be back and maybe can make a huge impact versus Houston? Plus, we go two-on-one with Chaz Ayu to talk about mental health and football and his off-season surgery, or I should say his season-ending surgery. Don't forget Top 5 Tuesday features the top five weird moments of the BYU-UTSA game. Here are today's BYU Sports Nation headlines. Number 14, Brigham Young prepares for its second road game of the season and third non-Saturday game at Houston this Friday night. Noctus, Nocturnus. Right. Seeds tonight. Offensive coordinator Jeff Grimes discusses the potential return of some injured players. Both those guys are moving in the right direction. Um, I think James is probably closer than Tristan. Again, uh, just like I said with Sione, we'll have to see what it looks like in practice the next couple days. Talking about center James Empey and right guard Tristan Hodge. So hopefully those guys are good. Uh, pre-game begins 7.30 Eastern Friday night on BYU Radio, 8.30 Eastern on BYU TV with Spencer Linton in the stadium. Between Jeff Grimes' mustache, his super low voice, the silvery hair, he belongs on an old Western set, right? Yeah, I, I think he's really missing out. You know, his real calling is in, a, in true grit, too. Or something. <laughs> yeah, I like that assessment. That's good. Right. That's one of the best assessments that's come from that part of the Eskimo. Oh, that's really good. Thank you. <laughs> Lorenzo Fawatea, BYU football defensive lineman, announced he will sit out the remainder of the season with an injury via social media. The particulars of the injury remain undisclosed, but he notes it happened against UTSA, and we saw him on crutches on the sideline. In Lorenzo's words, quote, the comeback will be great because even when we down, we up. Yeah, this is a bummer to lose Lorenzo Fautea, defensive lineman who, uh, by all accounts, could have been BYU's second best to Kyrie Tonga. Uh, Tyler Batty's like, whoa, 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 your boy has four sacks. But, yeah, hopefully uh, Zoe, as they call him, uh, gets better soon. Luckily, this is kind of a free year, and if he wants to – Return healthy next year, he can. Yeah. Heal up, Lorenzo. Face Mail scored the game-tying touchdown with 52 seconds left in the Saints' eventual overtime win against the Chargers last night. It's his first TD of the season. How about that? On the other side, Michael Davis had seven tackles in the game. I love all the fans who were like, oh, Chase Mail has been such a disappointment this season. Why did they give him all that money? And then he scores a touchdown to tie the game. They're like, oh, I love well, Chase M. Hill. Well, when he's the fourth highest player on the team, paid player on the team, needs to give a little more, right? He came up clutch last night, that's for sure. Right, we're talking about the previous four games, too. Well, you pay him for the overall resume, right? This season is not a standalone thing. He's been a valuable commodity for If I'm paying you 16 mil, I want more more than one CD in five games. That's Blind resume, that's fair assessment. The NCAA announces the potential of a one-time transfer allowance for athletes. Under this new proposal, athletes would be allowed the transfer during their athletic career. 
where they can play immediately. The proposal is expected to be voted on in January with an effective date of August 1st. Athletes would skip the sit-out-for-a-season penalty if schools are notified of their pending transfer by or before May 1st. So you just got to follow the protocols. Interesting. All rise and shout. It's time for What's Trending. You're talking about it, and so are we. It's What's Trending on BYU Sports Nation. We tend to get a little superlative on this show, if that's a word. But in this instance, I wonder if today's question really matters to BYU fans and really means something extra. Jerem, will the Houston game, the next game, one game at a time, Will the Houston game make or break this season for BYU football? Again, depends what you want. What do you want? If you want a New Year's Six, the answer is yes. I don't believe with the lack of strength of schedule in this particular set of games that if BYU has one loss, that they will be able to out at large a power team into a New Year's Six. So I think if, if make the season is New Year's Six or bust, which I'm not on that train, I would love it, but if BYU finished the season with the regular season with one loss, that's going to be a really fun season. Um, the chance of BYU winning that is uh, winning out is less than it is that they won't, right? ESPN FBI is BYU around 30-ish percent to, uh, to uh, win out. That's 70 percent chance you don't, right? Second highest chance to win out of right. any team in the country, by the way. Right. But I'm, pl- I'm pointing out 70% chance that you do not. Um, so, yeah, what, one loss doesn't break it for me. But if you're on the New Year's Six or bus train, given how BYU started the season, who BYU is playing, dot, 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 then, yeah, it would break it. Because if BYU does not beat Houston, I don't think there's enough on the schedule to out at large a Power 5 second or third team in the league. So I, I think this is a big game. Remember, this isn't a typical BYU schedule. This isn't a typical year. It's 2020. It's COVID. It's crazy. Um, So it's a big game. It's a big game. If BYU wins this, man, Texas State, Western Kentucky, 7-0 BYU goes into Boise in a massive matchup. But Houston's a scary team, given that they were minus five in the margin and still scored 49 points. That is crazy. How bad is Tulane is the real question. Tulane had two defensive touchdowns. That sounds good to me, right? But they, they only lost the Navy. Seven, they only scored 17 points on offense. Yeah, that's rough. And it does depend on what your expectations for are now this season. If your expectations are for BYU to be in the college football playoff conversation, oh, okay. then absolutely this game that's makes sick. or breaks the season. If your expectations are for BYU to be playing in a New Year's Day bowl game with New Year's Six money, then, yeah, this game probably makes or breaks the season. I will say this. Technically, BYU could lose this game, and because they still have Boise State on the schedule and San Diego State and maybe another team, we don't know what's out there. If BYU lucks into a big-time matchup against a Power 5 program because of a COVID issue, then technically they're not out of the New Year's Six conversation because we don't know who else is remaining on the schedule. But it seems tough. It feels like BYU has to go undefeated yeah. if they want to be in a New Year's Six game, and certainly if they want to be in the conversation of, yes, Blue Goggles on, the college football playoff. We don't know who else is going to show up on the BYU schedule. If it is a Power 5 team, they could lose to Houston, then run the table and beat a good Power 5 team and still be – in the rankings and discussed for an outside shot at a New Year's Six game. Right, and discussed different than make one. Like, if BYU has one loss, they will be discussed. I'm not arguing a discussion point, but who cares about a discussion? Like, if, if you get in or not is the thing. If BYU uh, wants to make a New Year's Six, they got to be Houston. Let me just, put it this way. Straight up, they got to be undefeated. they got to go. See, let me put it this way. If BYU loses to Houston, they have to add another high-level game and win that game to make a New Year's Six bowl game. To have a chance to make a New Year's Six, I, I, yeah, in my opinion. I, there's just not enough. I, I mean, there's three, there's three games of renown on the schedule, I think, when the dust settles. The, just imagine this. College game day sitting there on, like, the 19th or whatever, and they're discussing, okay, who's in the mix? And if, if BYU has one loss, let's say it was close to Houston, and they performed well and won by one score against Boise State, and they won by 10 against San Diego State or whatever. BYU is going to have to out at large somebody. So, That's why they need another game. So, so yeah. So look at the SEC 
uh, you look at multiple teams, right? So it's like, who's the best team in the SEC? You'd probably think Alabama at this point. Okay, Georgia, Florida just lost, but they're in the mix. If you're just going to have to out at large a team like Florida. So, for example, Alabama makes the college football playoff. Whoop, there's one spot. Uh, let's say Georgia was the next best team. They had two losses. They lost to Alabama in the SEC title game. Georgia would then occupy the SEC champs spot in the New Year's Six. Then there's an at-large spot for a Florida or a whoever, right? Um, BYU is going to have to out at large Florida or whoever. And again, I, I always explain this, but here's a disclaimer on the uh, New Year's Six. BYU does not have automatic access to the New Year's Six because of independence. BYU is not a Group of Five team and therefore cannot be the highest ranked and auto qualifier. The Cougars will have to out at large a Power Five opponent. Full game sold separately. No batteries included. Thank you, Ben. Uh, BYU is not a Group of Five. They have to out at large. They can't be automatic access. There's nothing like if BYU is in the top twelve. Oh, they're automatically. There's no automatic access. BYU's chosen this. So, yeah, I, I think it's a great idea you bring up, which is if BYU can bring up uh, have another high profile game. Then a one loss BYU is at least in the conversation. Yes. If BYU is undefeated, I am extremely confident, given where they are at this point in the season, that they would be in a New Year's Six. But undefeated is really hard. Ask Gifford Nielsen, Steve Young, Ty Detmer, Steve Sarr, everybody but Robbie Bosco how hard it is to go undefeated. It's hard, man. Then there's this. If BYU beats Houston and takes care of business against Texas State and Western Kentucky, and finally beat Boise State on the blue, and they're 8-0 with two games remaining, and up pops this opportunity with a Power 5 team in November. At 8-0, then Tomo has a decision to make. Do you take it? It's like, okay, well, we already passed the tough test against Houston and Boise State on the road, and we've got North Alabama and San Diego State at home. We think that BYU should probably win those games. Maybe I don't want the Power 5 smoke, because I have enough on the resume and an undefeated schedule that I'm going to get BYU into a New Year's Six game? Or do you take the challenge and say, yeah, bring on the Power 5 smoke because we want to play it, we want to beat it, and we want to show that not only are we New Year's Six worthy, but let's further our conversation into going undefeated against a legit schedule and be more talked about with the college football playoff. there, the decision-making is going to change by the day. There's too much risk to me in that. Because if BYU is undefeated, they're, they're perfectly fine. They don't need that. But this place has immense hubris based on the past. And, and, and it should to some degree. I think there's a healthy amount of that. But when, when, you, when you line up seven power fives in 2021, I go, okay, that's too much. You have too much horseradish for my taste, right? So uh, that's an interesting point. Um, I, I would say if BYU beats Houston, you don't want to add anything. Just just go at it, and you'd be okay. Okay, so if they beat Houston, but what if they had the opportunity to add the game uh, before Boise State, and the committee is saying, like, ah, BYU needs something else on their schedule. You can't like, add before Boise State, right? They sorry, sorry, I mean, you add a game so before like, BYU plays Boise State. If the game oh, right. opportunity oh, right, right. comes it's up in late scheduled. November, yeah. right, you're yeah. 5-0, and you're 6-0, and whatever, and that opportunity comes up. So for me, it's... Well, well what, you, what do we know of BYU's history? What do we know of Tom Holm? Is he going to say no? No, he's going to say yes. Well, again, this is an unprecedented year, so maybe he does say no and goes against the grain from what he's done in the past. Perhaps, but history has told us that he is not going to say no, probably, in this situation. <laughs> what, why, why would you say no to one Power 5 when you've already said yes to seven next year? Because you're undefeated and you're in pot- so position you, to go to a New Year's Six game. Well, I love it. I, I, if BYU pivots quickly like that, that's great. I've been asking for a pivot uh, for a while. So uh, COVID made BYU pivot, and now things are good. Uh, again, I'm not saying I don't want Power Fives on the schedule. I'm saying I do. But in this situation, making the New Year's Six is greater than anything else. It's greater than flexing. It's greater than adding. It's greater than anything. Like, making a New Year's Six would, ch- would recoup all the financial stuff lost for BYU, lost from no March Madness, from no fans in the stands. The financial benefit. Remember, being independent, BYU would not have to share any of that money. BYU is a spoiled kid that wants all the presents to themselves as an independent in a good way. In a good way. They're the only, they don't have to share with the Mountain West. They don't have to share with anybody in the league. That would be awesome. BYU has yet to be spoiled at Christmas. They have yet to have that season where they go, oh, gosh, we kept all this money and it was awesome. This could be the year, and I would say if BYU has a chance to – look, BYU is 14th after four games. I don't think they need to add a game to prove anything. They would only have to add it 
if they lose. If they lose to Houston. If they lose. Which yeah. goes back to my original point. And, and you bring up a good point. Like, if – well, do you add it just in case you lose to Boise State? Just in case – like, what, what wins – like, when you stack best wins for BYU against, you know, the other at-larges, you're going to need Boise State. You're going to need Houston. You're going to need San Diego State. We're hoping that Navy, La Tech, and at the end they end up decent. Because if they're just okay, it's like, oh, shoot. Like, who did BYU beat? BYU needs some of these teams to be really good. Here's the ideal scenario. BYU obviously beats Houston. And they beat Boise State. Or they get to the point where it's it, they don't have to add a game until they play Boise State. Okay, So meaning like if they win or lose, after that point, then if they lose to Boise State, then Tom Homo says, oh, there are these teams available. Let's go and add this team so that we can try and bolster the resume a little bit more, even though BYU lost at Boise State. Uh, that would be ideal to me, that BYU doesn't have to add anything until they play Boise State. They don't even encounter that scenario. They're trying to go undefeated. They're all in on that, and if they lose to Boise State, then they seek something out. Yeah. Let's see if BYU can just take care of business against Houston because it currently constitutes BYU does, does not need to add a game, although it feels like BYU wants to add a game. It feels like that. They have three openings, November 14th, 28th, December 5th. If you added a game on December 12th, that's way out there. They're going to play at home against San Diego State. Way out there. You would think that one more, either the 28th of November or December one, 5th, will show up. One more feels like it's coming down the pipe. I, I don't know anything I'm hinting at. Okay, well, what's, I, I'm Who is the opponent, though? I'm completely guessing. <laughs> right. And what Power Fives would play a non-con? Because it's it, at that juncture, right? Uh, Big 12 has said non-con. Is okay, but at home only, right? ACC was one non-con at home only. BYU'd have to go on the road to like a Power 5 team. Are we talking about an American team, perhaps? I don't want BYU to play Army, by the way. I'm cool with that game not happening. I'm, I, I don't need that game. I, I think BYU's fine. I think the way BYU played rocketed BYU up, and they're in a position where there's going to be attrition, and BYU will naturally slide into the top 10 if they keep winning. If BYU's... 8-0 and after Boise State? They'll be a top-10 team. They'll be a top-10 team. They will be. Just because they're undefeated, because of the way they played. And like we talked about, margin doesn't matter on this game Friday. And it doesn't matter against Boise State, and it doesn't matter against San Diego State. It will matter a little bit against Texas State and Western Kentucky and so on. But Texas State, or sorry, uh, UTSA showed us that, hey, the first three games, we already got to a certain plateau. You were so good that, that it didn't will, matter. Right. Right, just win now. Just win. Our question of the day. Will the Houston game make or break the 2020 BYU football season? Let's go to Voice of the Nation. This is the Voice of the Nation on BYU Sports Nation. At BYU Insider Answers on Twitter. Yes, it does. If BYU wins, then I believe BYU wins out. If BYU loses... Then it puts doubt into how good BYU even was and kills the New Year's Six discussion. We have expounded on all of this. Yeah, temporarily kills it. BYU can climb back into that. They continue. For a schedule with all group of five, you need to win versus Houston if you are truly a top 15 team. No excuses. Listen, I look at Houston and the speed, and pff, this is a tougher game than we thought. Like Houston, Houston that, if BYU wins this game, it, it validates what BYU has put up to this point. Because BYU has not played a team as tough as – this is the toughest team BYU will have played. And we'll see with Boise State. Maybe Houston's pretty good this year. Who knows? But they have speed. Like, they have skill. They have good linemen. They have good players. Think of Houston as a mid, mid-ish mid Power 5 team because that's the kind of skill level they have. This make-or-break question is loaded because there are so many moving parts to it. It's not – Set so we can say yeah as currently constituted if BYU doesn't add any Please other make games it manifest. And, you know as currently constituted if they don't add anything else then yeah it, it makes or breaks the New Year's Six chances but there's the opportunity to add something else later in the season three open weeks right now so Ooh. so that in that way it doesn't technically well, break it you can only operate in the uh, frame of reference you have right in front of you right man coming up will BYU still add. Another game to the schedule. We'll discuss. And BYU offensive lineman Brady Christensen joins us. Is he the fastest offensive lineman on this stacked position group? And what kind of impact will James Empey make if he plays against Houston? This is BYU Sports Nation. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. 
Tonight at 8.30 Eastern on the BYU TV app, it's BYU football with Kalani Satake as the coach and Greg Rebell who review the UTSA game preview of Houston, plus the film room and Deep Blue with Troy Warner and running back Tyler Algier joins the program. We are live in Studio B with your day-to-day BYU sports play-by-play. I'm Spencer Linton, teamed up with Jerem Jordan. Yesterday, I spoke with BYU offensive lineman Brady Christensen, one-on-one BYU Sports Nation all-access on the Deseret First Credit Union hotline. On topic, the return, or potential return, that is, of James Empey, lessons from UTSA, and the speed of the big uglies. Brady, let's settle the debate once and for all. Who's the fastest offensive lineman on the team right now? Me. <laughs> nah, I, I say it's me. I, I think it's a pretty close ca- uh, competition between me and Blake and Shannon. Okay, I'm going to arrange this race. I hope you know at some point after the season. <laughs> Deal, in the off season. <laughs> hey, what did you learn about your team after a hard-fought, closer-than-expected seven-point win over UTSA? Yeah, I think we learned more about this team than even the previous three wins. I mean, I've been a part of this team for a couple of years now. And we know that sometimes that those games haven't gone away. Um, so just to be able to pull through that, even though we didn't play our best and they played amazing, give a lot of credit to them to be able to pull through that and get the dub is uh, huge. I'll have, you know, that Jerem and I were blamed for creating hype around this BYU football team. And uh, that maybe that created a negative effect on BYU football. Did drinking the poison that we created have anything to do with what happened on Saturday? No, I think, uh, you know, college football, it's hard to win every week. And so sometimes you just come out and for whatever reason, we're not at our best. And that's just what happened on Saturday. And like I, like I said before, give credit to UTSA. They played their butts off. And so, I think it was just kind of a perfect storm and, and we didn't play our best, but we pulled through and got the dub and we're going to move on to next week. It's the only thing we can do. BYU junior offensive lineman, Brady Christensen with us on BYU sports nation. How would you explain the energy around this BYU football team right now coming off of that tough win as you prepare for what looks like the toughest challenge to date on the road against Houston? Yeah, we got, a lot of energy and a lot of uh, urgency. Uh, we, we have one less day to prepare uh, against a very talented Houston team. And so we're, we came back, um, put going to put this one in the books and then just move on and really focus on uh, uh, playing our best Friday night because that's what everyone wants to see and that's what we want to do. I know that you feel strongly in the depth of the offensive line. Coach Mateos was very complimentary of what Joe Tukuafu did in place of an injured James Empey. That said, what does James Empey do to make the offensive line better when he is playing? Yeah, credit to Joe. Joe's been amazing stepping in. He's uh, he's a stud, just an absolute baller. Um, but having James in there, there's a lev- level of comfort uh, comfort with him in there. I mean, I played 28 games with him, and so you kind of know exactly what he's doing and how he calls things and how, how he IDs things. So it's huge to have him in there. But Joe stepped up, like I said before, and did amazing. Okay, your offensive line has only given up two sacks. One of them was an intentional grounding, so it doesn't really count. So who's to blame for the one? Uh, All of us. If there's a sack, (laughs) all five of us are to blame. 100% 100% of the time. You are well You are well coached, Brady. You are well coached. <laughs> Fantastic stuff. All right, let's finish uh, with uh, some questions about Houston. What do you know about Houston's uh, defense and what they're going to try and do against you? Yeah, they are uh, very long, lengthy guys. Uh, they, pen- they rely on penetration and getting in the backfield and making plays, and they, they move a lot up front. So it's going to be a huge challenge for us uh, schematically and uh, also at Physically, they're a very physical team. So uh, it's going to be a good challenge for us, and we're looking forward to it. Hey, good luck against the Cougars in red. Take some BYU Sports Nation karma and enjoy playing in front of fans for the first time this season. Excited to do so. I got got some family coming down to Houston, so I'm excited for that. Outstanding. Thanks, Brady. Yeah, thanks. Brady Christensen on the Deseret First Credit Union Highline. Deseret First, you know why we show how. This is the first game that even BYU fans can go and watch. 10,000 expected, 25% capacity at Houston's new stadium for the game against Tulane. I don't know if that number is going to go up, but, I mean, until it's something that, different. It sounds we, like it's 25%, so yeah, they have a 40K stadium. Yeah, so 10,000. Gotcha. Okay. Get your tickets, BYU fans, if you can. Hey, listen, there are BYU fans that will be there. BYU, listen, BYU fans are incredible. We know this. Win, lose, draw, whatever, that they show up. 
Now, now you have a top 15 team going on the road for a big game. Listen, there's going to be BYU fans in this game. Brady said he's got some family. He's got some people that are going to be there. Absolutely. It's going to be awesome. Okay, coming up, Chaz Ayu joins us to discuss his injury and a discussion about mental health. BYU has earned four wins this season. Which of them is the best? This is BYU Sports Nation. There's one answer. This segment of BYU Sports Nation is presented by Visible Supply Chain Management. Join us tomorrow night as we take you to the Merritt Center for a live commercial-free broadcast of men's basketball practice, mic'd up, special guests. Watch the practice live. It's going to be awesome. 8 Eastern on the BYU TV app. He is Jerem Jordan. I am Spencer Linton, and this is BYU Sports Nation. Let's whip it. Cougar Whip Around presented by Visible Supply and Chain Management, tackling America's most challenging shipping problems. CBS Sports ranks BYU 10th in its college football power poll of teams that have played. In your biased opinion, where do you rank BYU? Right where they are, number 14. And I'm primarily going off of what a lot of national analysts are doing, and that is having seen teams that have actually played a game. So of the teams that have played right now, BYU deserves to be where they are. Yeah, that makes sense because you've got a couple in there, Ohio State, Penn State, Oregon, and yeah. whatnot, that are probably, you know, top 10, top 15 teams. I put them outside the top 10, probably, uh, you know, 12 to 15-ish. If this was a regular season and BYU was playing this schedule, I'd have BYU probably in the late teens. Think back to 2014. BYU had beaten two Power 5 teams in the first four, and we're still ranked 19th. So that, that's where I'd probably put them. Scott E. Ernest uh, says, you two should just start the show with the blue goggles on and have an alert when you take them off. <laughs> Fair point, Scott. Because, because we're talking blue near six. Alert. I'm definitely not talking alert. college football blue players. That's alert. not realistic. Blue goggles so alert. Alert. Chip, that's hey, um, but, here, here's the thing, though. The national analyst started this conversation literally against Navy. Yeah, I, I don't buy into it. Um, <laughs> Against Navy, interesting. Uh, BYU does have a, a, a significant stat that we want to bring up for today. Stat of the day with Skip. It's the BYU Sports Nation stat of the day. While BYU is not the only 4-0 team, they are the only team to have defeated four FBS teams this season. Schedule's too hard. Clemson, SMU, and Liberty are all 4-0 in terms of have played four games in, what, six weeks or something? Uh, yeah. No FCS? Is that scheduling too tough? <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> we we all we all want quality wins, and technically, with that stat of the day in mind, Jerem BYU uh, has more quality wins on the schedule than the other team. <laughs> uh. <laughs> okay, fine. Just sheer number of FBS opponents. Volume. Yep. Yeah. Of those four BYU wins that yep. BYU has against FBS competition, Jerem. Which is the best win of the season thus far? I think it's Navy. Season high in points, margin, season low in points allowed. It's the only road game BYU's played in, Monday Night Football. It got BYU on the map. I think Navy so far is the best one. Here's the only thing I don't like about that answer. That the, I said it? The rhetoric was more about how bad Navy was than how good BYU was. We're used to this. So that's why I don't like that win as the best of the season because... While Kirk Herbstreit and Reese Davis started the, wow, BYU doesn't have very much on the schedule. They beat up on Navy. But what if they can run the table? Like, that started that conversation. But the hype went next level after BYU and Zach Wilson destroyed Louisiana Tech. Then all of a sudden, he was in top five Heisman lists. BYU was a top 15 team. All of a sudden, the college football playoff comes into consideration. Kirk Herbstreit's got BYU two out. Her- Herbie mentioned the playoff after the Navy Two game. out? Yep, which is so awful. <laughs> So for me, it's the Louisiana enough. Tech win on a Friday night, everybody watching, it was going up against the NBA Finals and apparently got better numbers than the NBA Finals. Crazy. People don't like the bubble, I guess. <laughs> to me, that was the brightest light, and BYU crushed it. So for me, that that had the biggest impact. It's the best win of the season. Four games in, who's your defensive MVP? Ooh, probably, oh, man. Probably Troy Warner just with his two interceptions. And I think he's been a a solid addition, healthy, to the defensive backfield. So Troy Warner, if not Trajan Peely, is my most underappreciated defensive gym. Oh, sorry, Keenan Peely. Leading tackler. Is my most underappreciated defensive player. I go Peyton Wilgar because no no one really sticks out. It's been pretty balanced, which is a good thing, too. Uh, Peyton Wilgar is the only dude that's top three in tackles, TFLs, pass breakups, and quarterback hurries. So Peyton Wilgar. Okay. 
I don't think there's a wrong answer because BYU, as you said, had is such there a right good answer? balanced effort from the whole team. All right. We talked about the NCAA's posturing for a one-time no penalty transfer rule. Does that help or hurt BYU in that context? It's going to help and hurt everybody. There's going to be guys that bounce from BYU where you're like, what, what, what? Because they have no penalty now. But look at the staff. Three of the four as players transferred, and 10 of the 17 on the roster have transferred at least once. This will help BYU. It helps more than it hurts because of who Mark Pope is and what Mark Pope does for BYU, and that's go get high-level transfers. Down seven with a minute to go, third and goal from the nine. The Saints put in first ballot Hall of Famer, or took out, rather, Drew Brees. Uh, for Taysom Hill. Would you do that in that situation if you're Sean Payne? First of all, I believe it was third and four from the nine. I don't think it was third and goal. Correct me if I'm wrong. So, and I think that's why it was third and four. He opted to go with Taysom Hill because he thought even if they don't score, Taysom Hill can get me four yards somehow. We're going to get a first down and we'll reset with Drew Brees. And Drew Brees as well. <laughs> I, I'm fine with it because Taysom's a monster in third and short situations. There are so many different things you have to attest for. He's got Alvin Kamara next to him. I'm okay with it. Yeah, it typically has worked, right? Um, I I would not, man. Uh, Drew Brees is there. Yeah, you're paying. To, if I'm Sean Payton, yes. I'm legally trying to adopt Taysom Hill. I love Taysom Hill that much <laughs> if I'm Sean Payton. They're paying him 16 mil. Sometimes he fumbles against the Packers. Sometimes he scores a touchdown against the Chargers. Like, he scored more touchdown than fumble. This is true. Coming up, the top five weird moments from the UTSA. And BYU defensive star, linebacker, safety hybrid, Chaz Ayu opens up about mental health, beating the stigma involved, and his season-ending surgery. This is BYU Sports Nation. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Check out After Further Review, your place to see the X's and O's from the UTSCA game and how the Cougars take down Houston. Tonight, 7 Eastern on the BYT Gap, On Demand After. Welcome back to BYU Sports Nation in Studio B. Joining us now on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline is BYU junior linebacker Chaz Ayu. Great to have you with us, Chaz. Uh, you've been through a lot lately. Uh, I want to ask you about, first and foremost, the surgery. We saw you in a picture of a wheelchair. Your dad's pushing you around. you got casts on. What's going through your mind in that moment, man? Man, it's, it's been rough, but it's been a, bit, a big learning experience. Um, you know, you get a different, a different perspective when you lose both your feet. So, you know, it's been good uh, just hanging in there, just trying to get my body to rest up and heal as best as I can. So were you playing – with an injury already and then something ha- like what happened and you have you have injuries on both feet yeah so uh this has actually been a long lasting injury um i've been i've had it since high school actually and uh yeah i've i've just been rolling my ankles i roll them like every week man just consistently so you know we wanted to get that uh that healed up uh, i guess navy i had i had a compression fracture in my spine um on that fourth down tackle and so, uh, since that was done, you know, I had a, I was going to have to sit out for a long time anyway. So we figured that we might as well just kill two birds with one stone and get my ankles done. So wow. that's pretty much what the whole story is. Wow. Chaz, you're rolling your ankles every game. And I'm thinking about the plays you made against Navy. What can we expect when you're healthy? Because you played at such a high level against Navy. Man, you know, that's what I'm excited to see too. You know, I feel like I haven't been able to play at a hundred percent since high school, um, so, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see how this affects my body and, you know, how I'm able to move on the field. You said compression pressure on your spine. What, what is that? Uh, compression fracture. Fracture. Um, it's basically where I, I pretty much just squished one of the bones down in my spine. And so it's a, uh, yeah, I, I lost the, like a half an inch on my height. So <laughs> hopefully that doesn't knock me too much. But it, it, was, a, it was a pretty, uh, pretty big little little compression fracture that I had. So you lost a half of an inch. How do you, rec- how do you recover? Something like that. That rings. Yeah. How, how, does um, that just naturally heal? Do you rehab your spine? How do you, what do you do? Yeah. So it's a, it's an injury that you really can't heal. It kind of just over time, the bone will kind of grow back. But as far as going back to my normal height and all that stuff, it's not really going to happen. So, wow. Okay. Walk us through the timeline recovery of all of this. When, when do you expect to be fully healthy again? Um, so with my back, they were expecting me to be about eight weeks out. And so, and that wasn't guaranteed come back. I'd have to get more x-rays and stuff to see if I could even play after that. Um, and so with the surgery that I got, um, because of that, 
it's going to be about a six month recovery um, until I'm, it's all said and done. So it's a little lengthy one, but it's doable. BYU's got seven Power 5 teams on the schedule next year, Chaz, so they're going to need you healthy. This is a good thing, man. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was trying to weigh out the negative and the positives, and next season just, just made sense. So, Man, was it hard to make that decision to, uh, to call it, or physically was it just you got to do it? Yeah, it was actually really hard for me. You know, I want to play football. It was a long offseason for me coming off my shoulder surgery already. Um, you know, so I was pretty antsy to be playing football again. And so it, it was a pretty hard decision. I told the doctors, if my back is broken, I'm playing. But, uh, you know, obviously that's not my, my call. So, so we, uh, we called it a season and just decided to heal my body up. Wow. BYU junior linebacker Chaz Ayu with us on BYU Sports Nation. Uh, a week or so ago, Chaz, a story on you came out in the BYU Sports Illustrated column talking about your battle and struggle with mental health and, and how you have attacked that. Why was now the right time to go public with this and, and reveal such personal, sometimes people consider to be uh, embarrassing things? Oh, yeah. I mean, I definitely have those feelings towards it. Um, you know, but I felt like right now, you know, with what the, the country is looking like, what the world is going through, you know, I knew that, you know, there's a lot of people struggling with it. And, um, you know, I just the people that I got in contact with and educating myself about mental health, um, it's pretty alarming once you start to learn some of the facts about it. And so, you know, I felt that I needed to do something about that. Um, and I was pushed by um, this lady, Miss Fonda Bryant, and she's kind of helped me push myself to open up about this. Um, and, you know, she's a huge mental health advocate, and she said that there's lots of people that are, are struggling with it. And so I felt like I could be a voice for those people. Jazz, what did you go through? Um, you know, I went through a lot of up and downs. Um, I think the biggest thing when I started getting educated on it was just learning about, you know, what the roots are of it, you know, where it comes from, um, what it really means to have mental health uh, issues. And um, once I learned that, you know, I learned that it was actually very serious and it's a disease that, you know, if you, if you don't take serious, like I did where, you know, I called it weakness and just threw it to the side and, you know, didn't want to acknowledge it at all. You know, it kind of starts to, to plug your mind and, you know, some people are strong enough to, work their way out of it um, on their own and find ways to work out of it. But, you know, for me, I needed a little extra push, a little extra help. And so, you know, that's pretty much what I want to tell other kids and other people um, as well as adults and people going through is that it's okay to ask for help. And that's really my biggest thing. In the article, you talked about uh, depression and anxiety and uh, even suicidal thoughts. So uh, how did you cope with that? And, and how did you realize, Hey, I've, I've got to get some help here. Yeah. You know, the thoughts that come with it, like the suicidal thoughts and everything that come with it come from, you know, different experiences um, as well as stuff that could be uh, passed on from, you know, my birth mom and birth dad, stuff like that as well for other people. And so, you know, those suicidal thoughts that came were just, you know, really just feeling like things are going to stick with you for the rest of your life. Um, Obviously with my false arrest and, you know, the mission and everything living in in Utah where the culture of that, um, you know, kind of has a bad bad stigma to it um, on both ends you know it was kind of hard for me to get over those things and you know um you know suicidal for me was it was something that was very serious but you know I I'm glad that I was able to find a way out and that was by asking for help um, from people who have experienced this already it goes to that saying you doing this is quite the beacon of hope for a lot of people and there's there's no easy way to do it, but you did it. And so you should be commended for something like that. What are you doing now to try and continually beat this? How, how can others join with you? And if they're struggling in these instances, find strength. What what do they need to do? Um, you know, like I said, the first thing is just ask for help. You know, there's people that understand and it can take four or five therapists that you need to meet with before you find the one that fits you right. Um, but that was the the biggest thing for me right there was just having someone that you know, has that experience and can work me through it and educate me on it. And then, you know, second of all, the, I, it's really the little things that I do that have helped me get through it. You know, um, you know, I've been able to keep myself healthy, try to do things that, you know, are able to distract me and get me out of those bad times, those bad mindsets that I get into. So really it's just learning how to cope with it and, you know, handle it in a healthy way rather than, you know, resorting to unhealthy um, resources. How are you doing now? Man, I'm doing good. You know, I've made huge strides um, in my time since I've been able to learn about it. Um, you know, it's, a, it's something that doesn't just go away over, 
overnight or anything like that. So, you know, something that everyone has to work through that is dealing with it, uh, you know, and it takes a process, you know, just like taking the time to heal my ankles and my back. It's the same thing with, um, with me mentally. Chaz, I've spoken with people that talk about compartmentalizing these types of thoughts and say that it, you know, you have trigger times compared to when you're focused or engaging on something. So when you're in football mode, did you ever find these things creeping in or, or were you able to compartmentalize that? Um, you know, after a while, once I really didn't take care of my health, it started to creep in and affect, affect me in football. Um, and that was, that was really the hardest thing is to, you know, keep yourself mentally on edge in football as well as off the field. And so, you know, I, but I've been able to, to learn and I, I'm able to, you know, kind of distribute those things to where I'm able to take care of my mental health off the field as well as stay focused and stay, um, you know, focused on in football and things I need to do there. Helensky's Hope Foundation is a group that is focused on, obviously, Tyler Helensky, who committed suicide, a quarterback up at Washington State, and, and mental health around athletes and that discussion. And you're wearing a beanie, and BYU has been wearing a sticker the last couple of weeks. It's been very awesome to see that connection. What is, what is the message that they have and that BYU football is having right now regarding mental health? You know, our biggest thing right now is just we want to break the stigma that comes with mental health. Um, one around men uh, in particular, as well as athletes. And, you know, athletes of all groups, you know, women's and men's, doesn't matter what sport it is, you know, it's there. Um, they're competing to be the best in, in their sport. And, you know, sometimes people fall short and stuff like that. And, you know, especially if you have um, like a chemical imbalance with, with your brain where you have that depression or anxiety from, you know, sources that aren't affected by external things you know, it can be really hard when those external things start to go south. And so it, it can be really hard to uh, to push through that. And so our message is just to everyone is really just, you know, find help in that, you know, there's no one that is safe from it. You know, it, it can happen to anybody. Chaz, what kind of response have you received from your team, those close to you, and for that matter, from people across the nation since your message has gone out? You know, I've been received really well. You know, I've gotten a lot of positive things. Um, you know, I've gotten letters and, and texts, people reaching out saying that they've struggled with that their whole lives. You know, former athletes, athletes uh, in the NFL, um, ex-NFL athletes, you know, so it's been really good to see, um, you know, that, you know, I'm not the first athlete to deal with this. So I'm definitely not the last. Um, and, you know, there's names that are bigger than me. Um, just the BYU linebacker down here, there's dudes that are known across the country, um, you know, that are dealing with it. And they've reached out to me and, and have, you know, have shown me a good good things Chaz, we'd be naive to think that hey you're the only one on the team with mental health like there are so many people that have this right so what's the next step to continue to open this dialogue up and hope that we can break the stigma of this being a weakness but rather a thing that listen a lot of people and frankly maybe almost everyone right needs to a degree yeah um you know my thing is that you know people just need to be more comfortable in accepting and acknowledging that they have um, those issues. Uh, that was the biggest thing for me was I was in denial for a very long time. And that's what really drove me over the edge was just denying that I had it. And, you know, when you deny that you have the mental health, you automatically credit it to mental weakness or you're soft or you're not trying hard enough. And so that's the biggest thing is just to acknowledge it. And I feel like if athletes can just acknowledge it, that, you know, it'd make them a lot healthier. So if someone feels like they have something they need to talk about, what, what do you recommend them doing? Um, you know, the first thing that you need to do is tell someone that you, you trust, you know, someone that you can go to and you know they won't judge you. So, you know, I mean, that goes on both ends. You know, people need to be open and vulnerable to people so that they know that they can trust them. And, you know, once you know that, once you find someone that you can trust and open up to, it changes the whole game because you can go to them every day and you can tell them, like, how you really feel and you know they're not going to think that you're just doing it for attention or you're being dramatic or anything like that. And, then, you know, they'll acknowledge it for what it really is. There's real power in finding that safe zone and that safe environment. I know that your parents have been that and more for you. Um, how has your relationship with your dad, who is on the football staff, changed as you've gone through this? You know, it's, it's really improved. You know, me and my dad have already been really close. You know, we've done everything together since I was young. And so I think for him to, for me to open up to him about my, my struggles, you know, man to man, it was something that was very eye-opening for him. And so, you know, for him to 
accept me and not judge me on that or, you know, continue to call me weak or anything like that, um, that I was already calling myself. That really helped me and improved our relationship. Chaz, we appreciate what you're doing for uh, athletes across the country, really across the world, as you battle to uh, break that stigma. And once again, we commend you for having the courage to go out and, and be public with this. And, and we wish you a speedy recovery phys- uh, with all the physical injuries that you're dealing with. And can't wait to see you back on the football field, man. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thanks for having me. You got a Chaz you on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline. Deseret First, you know why we show how. This is a really serious subject <clears throat> and an emotional one, right? Because yeah. a lot of people go through a lot of things. Um, and Chaz is one who's talking about it. So Kalani Sitake has been a counselor this summer to his guys, right? With COVID, and you talk about just how weird life is, right? And then you, and then you talk about the injuries with Chaz and the expectation. Listen, when you come home from a mission early – there's an unfortunate stigma and judgment associated with that. Chaz dealt with that, not to mention mental health and what uh, he talked about. Uh, he dealt with an arrest this summer, which he says was false, right? And, and dealing with all of that, all of that, not to mention the injuries. I mean, it's just a lot. And everyone has something in their life. But, yeah, it, this is a conversation we need to have. And we've had conversations that have been non-sports on the show quite a bit the last couple months with, with uh, racial injustice and now mental health, and these are important conversations, and they pierce the sports world, and I'm glad that we can have those. So I learned a lot from that discussion with Chaz. I look at that, and as I talk to him, I think that Chaz will not only be stronger mentally, I I think this could propel him to something greater, honestly. I I hope so, absolutely. And hopefully that's – obviously off the field is number one, on the field as well, great. But if it doesn't on the field, it's going to be okay. It's because be he's okay. already taken strides. Because off the field matters more. This yes. A four or five year period of your life. Okay. Coming up, the top five weird moments from the UTSA. And did Cosmo earn his way in? What about Dax Milne and his ode to a great movie from the 80s? Stay with us on BYU Sports Nation. This segment of BYU Sports Nation is presented by Delta Airlines. Keep climbing. BYU Sports Nation's Rise and Shoutout is presented by Mountain America Credit Union, guiding you forward. The show available anytime on demand via the BYU TV and BYU radio apps. Or download the podcast. It is now time for Top 5 Tuesday, presented by Delta Airlines. Keep climbing after, frankly, a weird game on Saturday. We're taking a look at the top five weirdest moments in the BYU UTSA game. Jerem, start us off. Number five, BYU misses a PAT. That's weird because it's PAT. It happens, but BYU made 60 in a row. Jake Goldroyd, not good to go with some back spasms. Justin Smith had made three in a row, but missed the fourth. All good. BYU wins 27 points. At number four, Zach Wilson has made a lot of amazing decisions this season. This was not one of them. But you know what? He gets bailed out because the dude trying to intercept the ball, Tyler Mankey, has a club on his right hand. (laughs) I can't catch the ball, coach. My hand's broken. (laughs) Number three, your other hand's going to be broken. Cosmo's to go. Last week it was uh, in, a, in a bubble. Now he's doing a gainer. <laughs> <laughs> Not the smoothest of yeah, stunts. Yeah. Yink, yink, yink. That was the first one. The second one was better. Cosmo's <laughs> the best. I love Cosmo. Then he gets back. Oh, yink, yink, yink. <laughs> We're just glad Cosmo's okay. At number two, this play has all sorts of weird. First, uh, the camera's going to back out right as the ball snap. Yeah, then, what? then the cameraman what? decides to take playoff. Just throw it up. What, Playoff. What, what, what's happening? Troy Warner ends up with the interception. Everyone's like, wait, what happened? Wait, what? Uh, second pick. He said he'd do it. And we've got video evidence here. Thankfully, there are other angles. And number one, when Mason Wake is hurtling people every game, it's hard not to get involved. Dax Milne's like, hey, my turn. Here we go. Whoop. I nope, had just the time of my life. Jumps up. It's a, it's a moment from Dirty Dancing. 100, 100, <laughs> 107 yards. All good. Top five. <laughs> Our question of the day, will the Houston game make or break this season? Our elite voice today from Caden Young on Instagram. It'll be the game that makes BYU season. BYU just has to go out firing on all cylinders and keep the foot on the gas pedal. It'll be tough, but I think BYU can still win by 20 plus. I'll take one. Plus. Yes, win by one. Today's Rise to Chat Up presented by Mountain America Credit Union guiding you forward. Chaz Ayu, what he's doing is very important. An important conversation and stigma to break. Uh, Helinski's Help Foundation, as we mentioned, is a foundation looking to help with mental health. BYU is wearing a green sticker on helmets and a pin, which you wore, Spencer, yourself on Saturday. Very important conversation. Good stuff with Chaz today. 
you missed any of it, download that podcast. Our thanks to today's guests, Brady Christensen and the aforementioned Chaz Ayu. Start it and spin it, no time. Conversation continues 24-7 on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Use the hashtag BYU. For Jeremiah I'm Spencer. Shout out to Irvin Lee. Join us tonight on the BYU TV app for after further review, 730 Eastern, followed by 70. BYU. Sorry, 7 Eastern, followed by BYU football with Kalani Satake. Go Cougs.